All right, we are live. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first uh, Kwame webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. So before we kick off today, I'm just going to run through an update on what Kwame are working on at the moment, um, and then go through some general housekeeping rules uh, for this session. Uh, so our webinars are just one part of what Kwame are working on at the moment as part of our digital offer. Um, to keep the electrical engineering community connected um, and, and provide the opportunity for sharing trends and information across the globe, uh, we're happy that we'll be launching, as of today, uh, our three new digital content pieces. Uh, so these are Kwame Intelligence, Kwame Live, uh, and one that hopefully you're all familiar with, which is Kwame News, uh, in the form of the newsletter each, uh, every other week. Uh, our intelligence series are going to focus on core Kwame subjects once a month, um, and the first of these uh, is going to be starting off today with this webinar. Um, each of the uh, intelligence pieces that are focused on one of these areas, be that transformers, be that electric motors, uh, will then be followed up with a webinar at the end of each month. The newsletter um, will be then focusing on the latest market trends and what is going on at that time uh, bi-weekly. So have a look at our website for more information on the topics and the dates. Uh, hopefully, my colleagues will be able to share the links to those in the chat now. The first intelligence series, as I mentioned, uh, will be kicking off today. And in particular, um, this will be linked to our white paper, which will be coming out on the 26th of May. Uh, and you should automatically receive this into your inbox um, on that date. Uh, and today, I'm happy to say that we're going to be giving you a preview of our findings. So this morning, I'm joined by the authors of the white paper themselves, Jared Kirby, co-founder and Alice at Power Technology Research, and also his colleague, Saqib Saeed, who is the Power Grid Principal Analyst. They're both going to be talking you through uh, the market predictions for 2020 and 2021, focusing on transformers, industrial motors, EV traction motors, and EV hybridization. Jared and Saqib's presentation today will last for around 35 minutes, followed by a 15-minute q and I'm going to shortly hand over to them. Before I do, I'm just going to go through a couple of the housekeeping rules uh, for this session to make sure it all runs smoothly. I can see the chat is now starting to fill up as well, so good morning, everyone. You will see that you've got a panel on the right-hand side of your screen uh, with various tabs. So if you've got a question that you'd like to ask our speakers throughout the session, please enter this into the questions tab. The chat tab we will leave open for general, <clears throat> general discussion between the audience uh, and any comments or feedback that you might have for us but we'll only take questions from that question tab uh, at the end of the presentation today. If certain questions are more interesting to you um, or to save yourself asking the same question again, please use the upvote function, which is the small arrow on the side of the question, uh, and we'll prioritize answering those first uh, in the time that we've got today. Uh, we'll also ask for your feedback after the webinar, um, so please look out for an um, email into your inbox after this session. Uh, all the feedback that we can get from you is incredibly important in making sure that we keep these as relevant um, and as interesting for you going forward uh, for, the rest of the, uh, for the rest of the year. Um, just to kick things off, I'm going to make a, uh, a poll live. Um, this is another function that we have. So throughout the presentation, um, we will be posting interactive polls for you guys to interact with um, and just give our speakers a little bit more information about who we've got here with us today. So I'm just going to make this live now. Uh, and as that goes live, um, I would like to hand over to both of the speakers for today, Jared and Saqib. Over to you. All right. Fantastic. Thanks, Liam. Thanks for the kind introduction as well. Um, so good morning, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well and staying safe. Um, I hope everybody has seen over all the agenda points that we'll be discussing today. The topic will be kind of a sub branch of electrical engineering. So we'll be looking at the global market overview of transformers and motors. So this here is a, the overall agenda that we'll be discussing today. <clears throat> to start off, we have a brief overview of our company, what PTR is, and then we'll jump right into the topics of power transformers, distribution transformers, and then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Jared. He will be discussing industrial motors market and then EV traction motors. Uh, so with this, we have a brief video, introduction video of our company.
All right, fantastic. Uh, with this, um, I would like to show you a brief overview of the products and services that we have in the video as well that you saw that our focus uh, is primarily on the power grid topics. And then we have another vertical that we have in our coverage, which is the e-mobility. Um, these are some of the products and services that we have um, off the shelf included, um, starting off with the uh, power grid topics of transformers and switch gears. So some of the legacy grid equipment that we have in our coverage and within grid side, we have been looking into some of the new topics such as uh, asset health monitoring systems, fax devices, HVDC projects as well. And then in the last couple of years, we added another vertical, which is e-mobility sector that we have started looking into. Within e-mobility, we have some of the traditional uh, topics. Uh, part of it that we'll be discussing today, uh, Jared will be talking about EV traction motors, which is one of the topics that we uh, cover in our e-mobility um, research. And then we have uh, EV charging infrastructure as well. And then on top of that, some of the, let's say, non-traditional topics, commercial and off-highway vehicles that you can see on the left side, um, everybody talks about the um, uh, hybridization and also the impact of electrification in the passenger vehicles. Uh, but this topic actually covers uh, the agriculture or the construction vehicles. What's the electrification rate happening in those um, type of vehicles? So that these are some of the non-traditional topics uh, within e-mobility that we have started covering as well. So this kind of gives you a brief overview of the products and services that we have in our offering. And then uh, to give you a brief overview of the type of clients that we work with, uh, with our particular focus, uh, most of our clients are actually the companies uh, who work with engineered components and systems, but are, of course, um, clients uh, and the list of clients goes beyond that, where we have uh, interacted with the companies who actually invest in these enterprises and the large projects as well. Um, so they're, they're also definitely uh, part of our clients list. With this, I would would like to jump right into the topic of our discussion today, a power and distribution transformers market. The way we have segmented this today is first, we will be looking at, let's say, a snapshot of uh, what happened by the end of 2019. So kind of <clears throat> decoupling the impact or potential implications of COVID-19. And then really at the end, uh, we'll close this topic, looking at the potential implications of, of the pandemic and how it is impacting the market of transformers. Um, the, uh, the overall overview, we have segmented this into <clears throat> first market sizing, what's the, the market volume units, uh, the revenue volume that we're looking at, uh, different lenses we will be looking at. The first is the, of course, the global, and then we will kind of do a drill down into the regional markets and then further into the country specific markets as well. Uh, we have an overview of the suppliers as well. Um, what, what, what are the key, who are the key suppliers in the power and distribution transformers market? And then kind of linking all of this together with the market trends. What are the key drivers, key instigators um, that are behind the actual market sizing of transformers? So with this, I will start with the, the first aspect of the uh, topic, which is the market sizing. Now, the definition of power and distribution transformers, it varies in the industry as well. One way to have this segmented is to base it on MVA capacity, uh, the capacity of the transformers, and the other way is to do it based on the voltage. And that's the one that we have utilized. So 72 kV is the cutoff for us. Um, that part of has to do with our methodology, the way we cover these markets as well. Uh, a lot of our research is bottom-up research, uh, looking into the utilities, uh, distribution and transmission operators and a lot of the markets that we cover we have a clear distinction uh, differentiation between the distribution operators and the transmission operators which then gives us this definition of 72 kilovolts because that's that's how typically um, their assets uh, and networks are operating as well um, and that's what we have utilized over here as well so for us anything uh, higher than 72 kv would be power transformers and below that would be distribution transformers Overall market volume of 2019, uh, the total market size was 17 billion US dollars. If we segment this further into the regional lens, um, Asia Pacific definitely has the highest market share at 8.2 uh, billion US dollars. And that part of it is coming from uh, happening uh, expansions and replacements happening in China and India and some of the markets, let's say in um, Far East uh, region as well, where we have uh, let's say more and more a tendency towards renewables and of course expansion of the grid side as well. So these are the few instigators uh, of APEC market. I will be going into some of the details later as well 
um, country by country, what, what are the hotspots of these markets? And then we have uh, Americas as the second uh, uh, biggest market for power transformers. And finally, we have Europe, Middle East, Africa at 4.2 billion US dollars. If we look at the distribution transformers market, again, uh, the definition is below 72 kV. Uh, just a quick note around this as well. Um, a lot of the distribution utilities that operate are within one kilovolt to 40 kV range. And that's how uh, IEC voltage segmentations uh, are as well. Um, there is very few uh, companies operating anything uh, higher than 14 below 72 kV. So there's practically nothing in that. So it's essentially one to 42 kV. So transformers operating be it overhead uh, line transformers or pole mounted transformers. So that's all of that is included. Uh, in this market sizing. So we have a market size of 9 billion US dollars uh, as of 2019 for distribution transformers. If we do a very similar segmentation as we did for power transformers, uh, once again, uh, Asia Pacific market uh, has the highest market share. Um, again, different instigators, different uh, drivers uh, for the distribution transformers market. We'll discuss, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll discuss that in a second. And then we have Americas at the second spot with uh, 3 billion US dollars followed by Europe, Middle East, Africa at 2 billion US dollars uh, for distribution transformers market. Now, this is the lens I was talking about, kind of uh, drill down further into the um, country specific uh, markets. So uh, the, la the let's say the snapshot that you're looking at right now uh, is higher than 80% of the total market op opportunity in the power and distribution transformers. And once again, uh, this ties in with our methodology as well, because that's how we cover the markets of transformers and other legacy grid equipment as well to, to see um, basically that which utilities are operating in these regions, in these countries, and then basically um, having this methodology from bottom to the top uh, to get to the market size that you actually saw in the beginning of the presentation as well. Um, if we start our discussion from the right side, from uh, APAC region, we see China, India, um, if we talk about the instigators and drivers behind um, the high volume that we talked about, there is a mix of replacements and new additions happening. First off, just the sheer volume of, of the network, the expansion happening in the network in these two countries um, are a big, big factor uh, for the total volume that we saw uh, for the power and distribution transformers. In terms of replacements, there are different uh, market drivers behind that as well. Uh, for example, in India, uh, the overall TND losses is a big factor for more, more, most of the utilities operating in the network. And then uh, to enable them bring uh, the, um, let's say, the overall losses down to an acceptable limit, uh, transformers uh, is, is a big uh, portion of that. And of course, uh, other aspects such as distribution lines and reactive power solutions as well. Um, in China, we saw a replacement drive of distribution transformers, which was actually tied in with the um, eco-friendly nature of the transformers and also the, let's say, the carbon footprint because of the losses that happens in the transformers. Um, another aspect is the failure replacements in India. One of the big uh, market drivers for Indian distribution market is the failure replacement and usage of the um, substandard equipment. Uh, that is That was the case with a lot of the utilities, but as we see more and more processes being um, streamlined in the utilities, now we see uh, this getting resolved slowly. There was actually um, a, a plan back in 2015 to bring the losses of the distribution network in India down from which was as high as 20 percent, uh, which is a big, big portion. If you just look at the total volume of, of the energy that is channeled to the Indian uh, distribution network. So to bring it down from 20 percent uh, to 15 percent was a uh, milestone given to a lot of the utilities. And of course, uh, transformers it was one part of it. And then uh, other elements that I talked about, such as distribution uh, lines, is a other aspect of it. Some utilities were able to achieve those um, goals, and some were not able to achieve that goal of 15% cutoff, which was defined for uh, those utilities. And then now there's some discussions of having them uh, move or, or enforce a privatization in those uh, sectors as well, uh, in those utilities as well. Um, slightly different, let's say, landscape when it comes to the um, Far East uh, region, where we have uh, markets like Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, introduction of uh, renewables, uh, sl slow tendency of, of uh, let's say, the generation mix going towards is a big factor. 
um, expansion in the distribution grid itself. For example, if we uh, take uh, Vietnam as an example, uh, the capacity, the MBA capacity of the, the grid is supposed to double in the next seven years. So that is huge. Uh, that definitely ties in with the transformers market directly. Uh, if we then um, discuss the European market, of course, um, Western European markets have been uh, on the front uh, and leading from the front when it comes to the legacy grid equipment. We did see a slowdown overall in, in, in European market last year. Um, and, and a nice example of that would be Germany uh, as well. And however, we did see some positive uh, changes as well happening last year in Germany specifically. So one of the big, uh, let's say, instigators for any investment happening in the TND is the energy transition plan in Germany, and um, which basically uh, dictates uh, Germany going, uh, having more and more uh, reliance on the renewable and then less on the conventional, especially on the nuclear side. Um, and inability to uh, have the milestones achieved in the expansion of the TND grid was termed as one of the inhibitors uh, for Germany to achieve uh, uh, its uh, goals for energy transition plan. However, we saw uh, special laws being passed last year. So with that, we expect that things will start moving forward uh, very quickly. Um, if we move on to uh, the Middle Eastern market, especially in GCC, Saudi Arabia has been one of the key markets. Um, however, there was a slowdown that was uh, uh, observed in the last three years, I would say. It, for that, I think it makes sense to look at uh, from a, let's say a window of five to seven years where we saw massive investments coming in from Saudi electricity company, uh, huge projects installed and approved in the years 2014, 15, but then suddenly uh, there was a step function decrease, uh, primarily due to the fact that uh, the expansions within the grid, they were ample and uh, no other projects were uh, went through. But then at the start of this year, we did see some uh, movement again uh, before the pandemic actually hit. Uh, and uh, in the Q1, we saw some movement, we, which we expect that as the situation clear, this should be the case moving forward as well. Um, Egypt is another nice example to look at um, infrastructure investments, uh, new cities being built. That is a direct instigator for a high volume of a distribution transformers market in Egypt. Um, if we uh, discuss America's market, uh, US, of course, in terms of the volume, is the biggest market. In addition to that, Brazil is another interesting uh, market to look at, especially due to the fact uh, that um, privatization of the utilities now in Brazil has given, in the, in the recent past, which I should say, has given uh, more room uh, to play for international players uh, in that region. And overall, uh, its tendency, the region ten, region's tendency to go for smart grid solutions is something that has uh, been the case in the past few years and moving forward it will be the case as well so this was kind of an overview of the hot spots that exist in the market and this will be then an overview of the key suppliers and similar lens uh, that we have here uh, three regional markets uh, this is not an exhaustive list again you can tie it with the previous slide where we had the important markets um, shown and these would be the players operating in those in those markets of course there is many more uh, manufacturers when it comes to distribution uh, transformers because that is a highly fragmented market some some uh, points on that later as well um one clear um let's say um thing that we can note from here is um di between distribution and power transformers the the role of international players can be seen everywhere when it comes to power transformers or for that matter any um, uh, high capacity uh, or let's say high voltage uh, application of equipment let's say if, if it's hv switch gear high voltage switch gear uh, which is for the protection of power transformers uh, so that would be the case uh, we'll see more involvement of international players um, uh, and then uh, on the other side in the distribution transformer side that's where we see a lot of regional local players operating in the market um, another observation that can be made from uh, this list of companies is that um, on the right side uh, on, in APAC, we have some names uh, showing up which actually originate from, from the region. Um, and that is the case for uh, Europe as well, uh, that we have uh, some names which actually uh, originate from the region as well. However, if we look at Americas, that's where we see <clears throat> a lot of international players active in the market. And uh, especially for the case of US, 
uh, we have seen some let's say um, instances in the past where a us uh, is trying to promote its uh, local manufacturers uh, local industry of transformers because it's reliance on the imports uh, and then uh, the presence of international players is definitely uh, dominating as compared to the local players uh, some of the instances can be um the uh, latest executive order that we saw uh, which was published i believe not more than three weeks ago uh, which actually um is the, it talks about the uh, the presence of international players uh, and how in the uh, transmission network of the us um the local industry is unable to supply equipment that includes definitely uh, transformers as well um, and then a few years ago we saw um, some of the cases of uh, uh, import duties being uh, imposed on some of the international players uh, once again in an effort to help the local manufacturers uh, local industry uh, to be able to enable them to supply uh, to the us market uh, so these are the few instances uh, based on which uh, it can be uh, deduced that uh, U.S. is uh, pushing for its local place and then trying to enable its local manufacturers so that it can serve the local market in the U.S. So with this overview of the supplier side, so these are the few key trends. Some of them we have already discussed. So this would be kind of a recap of every region. Again, it makes sense to look at these trends from one region to the other. Um, we talked about the replacement drives uh, and, and we discussed how some of them are linked with uh, the efficiency of the transformers. Uh, Jared later will be discussing how um, efficiency and um, requirements of higher and higher efficiency um, is uh, it plays a role in the motor side. It's the same as the case for the transformers as well, because uh, from a high level, if we look at it, um, every kilowatt of uh, uh, energy um, uh, needs to channel through the transformers. Uh, that means the efficiency or let's say any losses happening in the transformer directly can be mapped uh, towards the CO2 uh, or, or carbon footprint. Uh, so that's that's the reason why we see some of the replacement programs, especially in China. And then there is, of course, failure replacements happening as well. We talked about the TND losses as one of the big instigators, um, uh, especially India is, is one example of that. And then there is other markets as well. Uh, we see Asian Development Bank actually working in collaboration with several countries in uh, Asia to, to help them cope with their TND losses. And of course, Transformers, once again, is one part of the equation. Um, we talked about uh, the supplier landscape as well. Uh, in China, um, we saw a kind of a step function increase in the, uh, the suppliers uh, of distribution transformers. So we see a higher and higher competition and more and more fragmentation when it comes to the uh, distribution transformers. Um, another aspect that we look into is what's the, let's say, the penetration of digitally enabled uh, equipment in the grid. Uh, again, we have several products being offered um, at this point in time, which are digitally enabled. Uh, and um, the, the goal from our side is to understand what is the traction for those devices? What is the uh, preference of utilities? And once again, I will tie it with our methodology, the way we cover this uh, market, looking at uh, from, from a utility perspective. Uh, traditionally, um, TND sector is considered as a relatively slow moving industry, uh, especially when it comes to acceptance of new technologies. So that's why it's crucial for us to understand which regions uh, have, and, and especially which utilities have higher tendency towards digitally enabled equipment. In Asia Pacific, China would be an example where we see this slowly penetrating. If we try to understand the instigator of that, uh, EV charging infrastructure will definitely be one, potentially uh, because of the fact that we have the highest installed base of EV chargers in China. Um, overall, uh, in, in the whole region, uh, electrification and urbanization, these can be let's say termed as the key drivers for any new uh, additions, because then th this gets tied with the generation, uh, more generation capacity, Any every gigawatt injected in the, into the grid needs to have higher MV capacity in the grid, which then translates to the transformers market. If we talk about European region, um, it's kind of a mix uh, between replacements and new additions. And new additions can directly be tied with the uh, distributed generation. Um, for example, in case of Germany, uh, an estimate of um, by the distribution companies in Germany is that by 2030, expected penetration of distributed uh, generation 
primarily renewables uh, in the distribution grid would be uh, higher than 50 gigawatts. That means the grid needs to be stable enough, strong enough to be able to cope with that much penetration of renewables um, in, in the grid. Uh, and that's where uh, all the uh, investment uh, is coming as well. We did have talk about the overall slowdown uh, that was experienced last year. Um, and then also the um, uh, eco-friendly uh, directive as well. So this this one is specifically for uh, European Commission. Uh, so one part of it was implemented uh, back in 2015. And then the next year is supposed to be uh, enforced by 2021. Uh, again, uh, we'll discuss this in detail in the next part of the discussion where we have this tied with the motors market. Similar, uh, let's say, discussion on, on digital digitalization. Uh, we see more and more utilities thinking about that. Uh, it's not only the transformer side itself, but also other equipment that goes into the substation. So overall, let's say, mindset of the utilities um, is towards having these uh, digitally enabled uh, pieces of equipment installed in the grid. Uh, within the European region. <clears throat> in terms of the supplied landscape, uh, we see a lot of the European suppliers because of the ease of, of, of access to the, the countries. Uh, so they definitely dominate the market of transformers. In case of Americas, um, US, uh, we talked about US being the, the biggest in terms of the market volume. Um, the TND infrastructure, it, it's a well-known fact that uh, aging is a big factor and that directly impacts the, the grid resilience reliability uh, of the US grid. So tendency of the utilities to go for uh, intelligent solutions uh, to help them um, have that factor of online condition monitoring or predictive maintenance is a big factor these days. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance between uh, having the equipment or having these intelligent solutions installed in the grid uh, to, to uh, sort of extend uh, the, the lifetime of the equipment as well. Uh, because then you will be able to uh, make intelligent decisions based on the data gathered. Um, if we talk about some of the new advancements that we have seen in the region, um, uh, overall uh, segmentation between overhead line versus uh, underground equipment is, is, a, is a nice indication for us to understand what kind of equipment would be going into the network. And in case of uh, Americas, of course, a big, big portion we talk about US, Brazil is overhead lines based and protection equipment for transformers traditionally and overhead lines has been fuses. However, in the recent past, we have seen, uh, let's say, more and more preferences of utilities to go for solutions which are, let's say, more modern, and they can be coupled with the traditional solutions of fuses uh, to improve their KPIs. We talked about US trying to support the local uh, transformer industry with, with certain regulations uh, in the recent past. Uh, South America, uh, an attractive market right now uh, when it comes to smart grid investment. Overall uh, mindset of, of the utilities and uh, the network itself is, is the dynamics are changing. Uh, part of it has to do with the uh, privatization of the companies as well and the inv involvement of, let's say, uh, companies, presence of the companies such as Enel uh, in, in the region is a big factor. If we talk about uh, south, outside the US, uh, Generation mix is definitely uh, moving towards uh, distributed generation resources, and that will result in uh, more investment uh, in the transformer market as well. Next up, we have uh, Middle East and Africa. Uh, we talked about a slowdown uh, and then potential, uh, potentially these, these markets bouncing back as well. Uh, we took an example of uh, Saudi, uh, where we, we saw uh, in the Q1 uh, positive movement, and then we expect that as the situation clear, clears, uh, this would be the case moving forward as well. Um, in case of Africa, we saw um, some of the renewable energy plans. Uh, countries were unable to meet the targets uh, because of the lack of investment. Um, moving forward, we expect this to be the case as well, even though there is uh, some uh, presence of entities uh, in terms of the investments, some of the Chinese uh, presence as well. Um, for the investment part, but still um, the high, uh, let's say, targets of renewables, uh, we believe that uh, those investments might not be uh, good enough uh, to achieve those targets. In case of uh, other smaller countries in the region, uh, a lot of the times they are one short opportunity. Uh, any expansion that happens in the grid, any replacement that uh, is planned for the grid, it's, it's uh, uh, let's say, planned for a very short amount of time, and then it's good enough, It's the capacity is ample, in the grid and then there's no uh, let's say movement for a few next years so that's why we're terming it as one shot opportunity 
no specific focus on the digitalization we do not expect uh, apart from maybe saudi uh, saudi arabia where we uh, expect some industrial uh, customers to go for uh, digital solutions uh, especially in the oil and gas sector but beyond that we do not expect um, this to be the case for the rest of the region um this is a, a specific aspect um having local presence and uh, uh, the local content uh, requirement is is a key uh, topic uh, these days uh, for markets like Saudi Arabia and also uh, in some of the African countries as well. So it does play a role for the suppliers that are actually supplying in these markets. So with that, um, so that was kind of an overview of what has happened up until now, uh, well, before uh, the, the COVID-19 situation. To understand how moving forward, what would, what would be the impact, uh, the million dollar question, what's the impact, direct impact on the transformers market, it's important to see segment it into the vertical. So we look at utilities, uh, generation, and some of the energy intensive industries as well. So it makes sense to look at these industries and understand what is the impact that we have seen of COVID-19 in these different sectors. Starting from utilities, uh, we saw a decrease in consumption, and then of course that's that's definitely uh, can be tied with the uh, cash flows. Uh, what we expect is that uh, momentarily um, during this uh, these two quarters, Q2 and Q3, uh, of course there there is a slowdown, and then only uh, essential uh, maintenance and repair um, programs they will be um, carried on. However, any new additions or large expansion plans they will be can uh, not cancel i would say they will be delayed for sure and q4 would be the uh, point where we will start seeing uh, the demand coming back online and then uh, utilities going back to the original uh, plans of expansions same uh, kind of uh, trend was observed in the power generation as well in fact there's there's two uh, aspects to that one is a reduction in the demand which directly impacted uh, conventional ipps uh, definitely and then the other aspect was disruption in the uh, the supply of the equipments because the fact that pandemic had hit china before uh, other parts of the of the world and that kind of created um, uh, issue from the supply side for the renewables uh, an example would be a uh, three gigawatt of renewable projects are expected to be delayed in uh, india overall in the generation sector um, the expected growth was 13 percent which we think because of the pandemic this would be slashed by 60% roughly. Two other sectors, which um, actually, uh, even outside the, the effect of pandemic, were already uh, impacted due to several reasons, automotive and oil and gas, and of course, the, the further um, uh, implications due to COVID-19 are there as well on these two um, sub-verticals, and then that's what is going to show up in the transformers market as well. And finally, on the data center side, that's one of the, uh, let's say, market verticals where we expect um, to, to, to have a positive growth uh, because of the overall fact that um, server traffic has increased with a lot of the workforce uh, around the world working from home. So that would be one of the instigators where data centers market will see uh, growth in the future years. In addition to that, there was another um, sector which actually saw growth in the middle of the pandemic, which was infrastructure. Um, having temporary hospitals, makeshift medical care facilities was one factor uh, as well, uh, for sure. Um, uh, and then there was a definite increase, but then uh, that went away as we had uh, enough facilities coming online. So that, that was another, let's say, uh, sub-vertical where we saw growth happening for the transformer side. So this is it from my side uh, on the transformers. At this point, I would like to hand this over to my colleague, Jared, who will be discussing the industrial motors market and then EV tractions as well. And then after that, uh, Jared and I will be available for a Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Saqib. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jared Kirby, and I'll be focusing on the electrical motors uh, kind of in two lenses, one in the industrial motors market and applications, and two in the EV traction motors, primarily for plug-in hybrids and pure battery electric, but also touching on the topic of, of hybrid, uh, mild hybrids and micro uh, hybrid vehicles as well on the application. So just an overview of what I'll be discussing. We'll start with a overview of 2019 and the market from last year. Uh, I'll focus also on a trend uh, that was recently updated in October. Uh, and discussing a little bit about that on how it might impact the market and sales for electric motors and industrial applications. 
And then of course, we'll get into the outlook and future impacts, also tying this into COVID-19, as well as impacts on the supply chain for the electric motors and industrial applications. So in 2019, the industrial motors market accounted for just under 26 billion US dollars. Within that, we have about 80% low voltage and then about 20% medium voltage. Now, within the low voltage, we have uh, fractional horsepower motors, uh, integral motors. We also have stepper motors, uh, DC motors, geared motors, all within that category as well. Just to give you an idea of kind of the breakdown there. Overall, uh, 2019 was about a 1% growth, uh, relatively flat over year over year from 2018 sales levels. Uh, this is due to primarily a slowdown in Asia Pacific and Europe, uh, heavily tied to the automotive sector and as well as machine tools in Europe, specifically in Germany. And this is also due to we being considered the 2019 a balancing year. Uh, there was high growth, uh, high sales figures in 2018 as well as in 2017, looking at five to eight percent year over year growth for those years, which for a very mature and established market of industrial motors is quite high. There was a lot of uh, stocking and even in some cases of overstocking of inventory, which led to kind of more of a flat, flat year for sales in 2019 for industrial motors. Uh, so we have about 40% of the market in Asia Pacific. Uh, likewise, with the transformers markets, it's heavily uh, influenced by the Asia Pacific market itself, as well as EMEA and Americas having a significant amount of market. Americas, specifically the US last year, was kind of pillared by the oil and gas and chemicals investments. Uh, however, uh, we do see some changes in the market, of course, as you know, for this year, which I'll get into a little bit later. A recent trend within the industrial motors is electricity consumption. Saki alluded to this a bit in his presentation and how this ties into transformers and distribution transformers, but also what this means for the electric motors. So there was initiatives and directives over the past decade, let's say, uh, targeting this efficiency on the motors themselves. The main reason for this is based on IEA, the World Energy Outlook uh, from 2016, about 52, 53% of the global energy produced is consumed by electric motors. And here this graph will show the shift, uh, the difference within the uh, kind of more commercial and industrial applications. Of course, you see the higher percentage in the industrial side as the motors are the primary mover uh, of these markets and therefore would take the majority of the electricity there. With that said, uh, there is a, a this, we call it a decade of difference from the initiatives uh, launched in 2010, such as the ERP directive in Europe, as well as NEMA, uh, as well as Age Pacific uh, Efficiency Direct as well on a global level. And this shows essentially the change from 2010 to 2019. The key points here are the, the growth of the IE3 motors and as well as the decline in sales for IE1 and IE2. Uh, an important point of this is the that growth in IE2, as you can see, about 46%. Uh, this was due to the mandates uh, kind of adhere. Uh, you're able to adhere to the mandate by having an IET motor attached to a variable speed drive. However, in October last year, Europe just passed recent uh, updates to this uh, that this will no longer be the case. Uh, they're also looking at the drives themselves as separate systems and then looking at the whole system as, as a kind of combination of the efficiency of the components. So this means that there's going to be an increase in sales for IE3, IE4, and even some manufacturers are promoting IE5 motors due to the efficiency levels. Uh, we see this having a significant impact over the next decade going into 2030, uh, as we've seen here uh, over the past decade recently. Now, this will go into effect in July this year for the recent mandate in Europe. We expect this to ripple through uh, the Asia Pacific as well as the Americas markets, of course, delayed. Europe is traditionally the early adopters of energy efficiency mandates, and we'll see this kind of shift through to the other regions uh, later on, and it'll be more of a delayed impact. It's not a kind of a light switch impact. It's more of a long, uh, let's say over the next three to five years, we'll start seeing the impacts of these mandates on the market and increase in sales of higher efficiency motors, uh, not just with the variable speed drives themselves. And an outlook of 2020 and some future impacts for industrial motor applications. Of course, this is also tying to the current situation with COVID-19. 
uh, it's a bit somber, but we do have some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of some optimistic outlooks that we have. In 2020, we're looking at a 10 to 20 percent decline globally for the industrial application motors. Uh, this, of course, will differ by region. We have already seen kind of a, a turn of the corner for Asia Pacific in terms of manufacturing and production and also consumption. And we, we see a significant decline in Europe as well in the Americas and probably will be prolonged. Uh, globally, the trajectory is looking into 2022 uh, as a slight recovery uh, and then probably 2023 as a, a recovery back to 2019 levels. Uh, of course, this also differs by each region, uh, but this is the kind of the general outlook that we see from the COVID-19 situation. And this would also differ by each vertical and sector within the, the manufacturing verticals. So, of course, food and beverage is very resilient in the times of recession and downturns, uh, whereas we have, of course, oil and gas, uh, more investment and capital expenditure driven process industries will be more severely uh, hit and decline in the short term uh, and in the long term. Uh, we do see a positive side to this, a more increased willingness to invest in automation for maybe traditional applications that used uh, more constant speed applications or more manual or semi-automated processes. We see an increase in adoption of automation, which in the long term is very good for motor suppliers and also the supply chain within motors, in turn, including coil winding. Uh, machine builders and, and these types of players in the market. Uh, so that is uh, kind of how we see it overall. And this will probably be a slow shift as well. It's not going to happen very quickly. Right now, companies are trying to get by, so to say. But in the long term, we do see more of a preventative action taken by increasing the adoption of automation within factories and manufacturing plants. We also see a likely trend, or we predict a likely trend of an optimized supply chain. Now, we don't see a significant shift in supply chain in terms of, let's say, leaving China as a main supplier. However, we do see an increase in alternative supply chains on more local or domestic markets. Uh, we see kind of these rolling, running in parallel. Uh, we would expect this to happen over the next, of course, several years as well as supply chain shifts are very, very slow to, to happen. Um, and these are essentially, in a way, a paradigm shift of the supply chains currently. But what we'll see is an increase in local supply, even local customers, uh, supply chain for the suppliers uh, themselves. And we'll actually see a, a parallel local and foreign supply chain network kind of grow uh, in the next, let's say, five years uh, is our prediction. Sticking on the supply chain topic, topic we have a couple of points. Um, I'll briefly go over each of these. And of course, we can discuss more during the Q&A session at the end. Uh, in the terms of the raw materials, uh, we do, of course, see an impact both from the supply side and demand side as it was a shock on both with factories shut down and also consumption on the consumer side more uh, specifically was slowed. Uh, we also see a reliance on inventory and stock uh, currently uh, for the suppliers and kind of more of the middle distributors for the, uh, the inventory of the electric motors. And then this will hold over until the demand is increased again later on this year or the middle of next year. And we also see short term, of course, reduction in sales for motor manufacturers. But however, we do see this kind of being made up in the end of long term with higher and, and increased adoption for things like remote operation, remote management, as well as remote monitoring for the systems, which will require uh, automated systems within the factories themselves. Uh, we see supply chain constraints uh, that will increase the direct sales from the suppliers. And this may impact the, let's say, middle tier uh, handlers and distributors within the sales channel. More significantly, uh, we do see an increase in direct sales from the suppliers, uh, as well as even an increase in the online uh, application in terms of sales that in, in that avenue. And then tied to also motor manufacturers, the end users are also likely to adopt more uh, willingness for the automation in the future. and. Uh, in, increase the adoption of these products uh, over to hopefully uh, if a workforce is jeopardized in any way with a pandemic or whatever it might be, they want to have this fallback and, and kind of a safety net on the automation side in order to at least maintain minimum levels of operation in the factory. 
So that was for the industrial motors. Uh, and then I'll shift over into a focus for electric motors within the EV traction motors side of the, the applications as well. And just a quick overview on this, I'll again talk about overall market in 2019. Uh, we'll talk about a shift in uh, technologies within the market as well. A few other key trends to kind of brush on and then as well discussing a bit more in detail uh, the impacts and outlook uh, of the future and the supply chain impacts of the COVID-19 situation. Now in 2019, EV traction motors summate, uh, sum to about 2.8 million units uh, overall. Uh, this is about 14% year over year growth from 2018 levels, uh, which is quite significant. Obviously this follows the adoption of EVs. Uh, this is primarily plug-in hybrid and battery electric uh, EVs and these figures here. And within that, uh, we have about 45% of that market, of course, within China. And then the rest of the market is split between, let's say, Europe and the Americas. Uh, this is, in terms of technology, this is primarily permanent magnet synchronous motors, about 80% of the market, with the remainder made up of uh, hybrid traction motors, as we call it, HTM, and then AC induction motors. And there's a trend uh, that I'll touch more on on this slide within the technology side. So we see a growth uh, for the hybrid traction motors technology. And there's a few reasons for this. And this is primarily due to the hybrid traction motors having the ability to use reduced amounts of permanent magnets and therefore reduced volumes of the rare earth materials would be required. Uh, now, this is a, a trend that's currently happening. We've seen examples of this, uh, the motors used, and I'll touch more on that a little bit later. But essentially, we see the permanent magnet synchronous motors remaining the more dominant topology for the motors themselves. Uh, but we do see the hybrid traction motor technology being uh, the fastest growing. Um, examples of these would be we call the BMW i3 motor would be a hybrid traction motor. The Tesla permanent magnet motor as well, relatively newer to the market, uh, would be an example of this motor. Uh, and there's, of course, more development going on in R&D and these types of motors uh, and as well. Um, in, the, in the future coming up. And so we see from 2017 to 2022, we estimate about a 5% shift and in increase in hybrid traction motors from 14% to 19%. And then where that would primarily be taking market share from is the AC induction motor, which we see as losing market share uh, in the overall technology uh, for the electric vehicles. Now, as I mentioned before, this is primarily for plug-in hybrid and battery electric hybrid uh, vehicles, uh, but and, and overall, we see the shift also in the uh, the hybrid vehicles and, and even the, the mild hybrid vehicles potentially coming up a further in the future. And then we see a slight shift down permanent magnet, which is why it might remain the dominant technology. Permanent magnet synchronous motors would be actually have increased in 2019 from our assumptions. They increased to about 79%. And then we forecast a, a relatively uh, slow downturn, but uh, re reduced demand for these motors uh, overall. Uh, but, but much further down the road, of course, in the, in the more short term, they're going to be the more dominant topology used. And a few other trends within electric vehicles, uh, traction motor technologies, is the uh, couple of technologies to look at. Uh, axial flux uh, is heavily being researched and designed in terms of the overall market. Uh, some of the advantages of this might be a lower footprint, a higher power density, uh, but in terms of mass manufacturing, this is still yet to be seen. There are companies such as Yasa in the UK. Uh, we have magnets also in the R&D phase, later R&D phase uh, of this market, uh, and others are also developing this technology. Uh, we do see this technology being uh, much more, uh, more dominant in the future, and in looking at permanent magnet synchronous motor, uh, we think this motor technology between traditional radial flux will gain the market share uh, over the next, let's say, 10 to 15 years. But this is also a longer term shift, uh, as well as switch reluctance, uh, older technology type, as many of you experts may know. Uh, however, there's been recent developments on the uh, controlling um, the, the, the voltage ripple of the product itself with the control technology and the power electronics, uh, as well as the manufacturability. Um, a lot of suppliers are working on this issue uh, for this motor and if those are overcome we think this motor might have a potential within the overall traction motor uh, power market uh, we see rare earth material becoming a moot point um, currently suppliers especially the large ones will buy maybe like on a five-year plan with set prices for five years so uh, the volatility from the design side is less so but we do see increased volatility on this market uh, in the short term 
uh, with the majority of the refining and even the mining itself uh, controlled within China, which of course creates a heavy dependence on the market. Uh, but we do see an increase in the hybrid traction motors uh, that also will be able to use reduced amounts of the rare earth materials and permanent magnets. And moving forward, we see this being less of an issue in terms of the volatility of the prices for those materials. Uh, we also see uh, potential for opportunities in micro and mild hybrid EVs uh, due to simply the larger volumes within these markets in the near term. So we have uh, a lot of e-axles, a lot of Tier one suppliers uh, traditionally within the ICE market have now ventured into uh, the micro and mild hybrid applications for these uh, applications and e-motors. Uh, so we're looking at probably an increased adoption of these products, primarily with the permanent magnet motors, but also low uh, footprint and high power density su supplies for these products as well. Uh, we also see an increase in the multi-motor platform trend continuing. We had about 17% from our estimation uh, looking at each vehicle model and the types of motors and the power of the motors. We did our uh, database analysis on this about 17% 17, 17 in 2019. And that was about 20%, a 3% increase in 2019. And we see this trend to continue. Uh, you can see the recent uh, products and, and OEMs uh, deliveries for the, for example, Jaguar, we saw uh, Audi, uh, as well as Mercedes come out with dual motor topology motors. And then there's also the the Tesla, which the Model S is no longer distributing and supplying the dual motor, uh, sorry, the single motor system. They're only supplying the dual motor uh, system for their EV uh, shipments and sales at this point, which further strengthens this trend here. And looking at 2020 and overall future impacts within COVID uh, environments, uh, we see a steeper decline compared to the kind of the presentation I had on the electric motor side for the industrial applications. Uh, we see this as being a little stronger, maybe 15 to 25 percent decline. Of course, that's heavily tied to the automotive sector uh, for both supply and demand shocks. However, factories are coming back online. Uh, Volkswagen is now uh, opening up factories and plants, um, and we do see uh, very positive uh, things happening in the market in terms of the automotive. However, I think the the current situation has led to the decline remaining for the, the rest of the year, as well as consumer demand uh, remaining at a bit of a lower point as well. Uh, we see this also as a slower trajectory, probably into 2023, maybe even further until we get back to the previous levels of 2019. For the sector, however, we do see an increase focused on R&D, of course, with the motor topologies and technologies that I had mentioned. And we see this as being a, a focus for these companies to internally invest and, and provide capital resources to the research and development and optimization of the motors themselves. And then there's also a trend for long-term shift into the alternative motor applications, which will also tie into the increase in the R&D uh, within this uh, during the, the, the downturn currently for the COVID situation. And sticking on the supply chain notes a little bit for the, the current situation, uh, of course, we do have the, the kind of more trade tensions, uh, geopolitical situations, which are variable and, and volatile. Uh, however, we do see uh, an increase in these, these tensions and a reduction in global trade overall uh, for the material supplies uh, for the electric vehicle traction motors materials. <clears throat> we also see the local supply chains uh, being more of a, a favored supply chain. As I mentioned in the industrial motors applications, we see this trend also here in the EV traction motor supply chain as a parallel supply chain for the EV traction motors as well on the more local and domestic markets. And we see also increase in the collaboration and acquisition phases as well, likely in the next 18 months. Uh, we expect to see more acquisition and also joint ventures and collaboration within the motors, suppliers, and the OEMs themselves, and as well as even the tier ones, because depending on the company, it's either vertically integrated within the system such as Tesla, or maybe they will use an outsourced motor supplier and technology provider for the, the traction motors themselves. <clears throat> and due to the increase in the e-axles and the micro and mile hybrid, there will be a, a gain in OEMs in collaboration with the tier ones for parts assembly and production uh, due to the lower capital cost and R&D needed for the, the mild hybrid systems themselves. And there'll be uh, an increase on the sub-assembly collaboration as well. And for the overall EV 
vehicle OEMs, uh, we do see the increase uh, focused uh, on competition. Um, of course, there's new entrants in the market just about uh, every 18 months uh, in general. And we do see this as being uh, an increasing trend uh, overall on the EV traction motors market as well, uh, with new players and new technologies coming out uh, with the market. And maybe we haven't even seen uh, a final technology for an EV traction motor. And uh, maybe there's advancements in the cooling side or other technology advancements within the motor market that uh, may throw off all these forecasts that I've showed you already, but uh, we're optimistic and, and see a, a positive swing overall, probably by mid 2021 uh, for the overall markets and a, a positive kind of shift into the market growth at that point. And with that, I believe we will now open up to questions and answers with my colleague Sakib uh, for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Jared and Sakib, for that. Uh, and I'll start to work through some of the questions we've had through from the audience now uh, for our final five minutes or so. Um, so we've had a few questions in uh, regarding to both sides of the presentation. Um, so the first question came in from Nikhil um, asking uh, Sakib, um, when would the world see the manufacture of solid state transformers, both power and distribution on a mass scale? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I did uh, talk about a little bit about the, um, let's say, tendency of utilities slowly going towards new solutions. So this is one thing that we actually we did investigate uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a new concept of having uh, power electronics based transformers. Um, apart from a few prototypes installed, small projects uh, supplied in SST, currently cost cost is a big issue. Uh, five times the existing solutions is something for which utilities won't go away uh, right away behind uh, for this solution, uh, primarily uh, because the, let's say the benefit of uh, between the, the cost and let's say the uh, functionality of uh, SSDs is not there yet, according to the utilities. So we do not see any movement in the next five to seven years, at least uh, for uh, SSDs uh, and, and power electronics based solutions in the transformers. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a second question, I believe, again, uh, for Saki, but both feel free to answer, uh, from Hassan, uh, which is the new US regulation around local suppliers. Uh, does that mean that you need to be a domestic supplier originating in the USA? Or if you're an international supplier with domestic manufacturing, uh, are you exempt or are you fine under these rules? I see. So it does not, st the uh, executive order that I, I mentioned, it does not state it directly, but we can actually uh, take some notes from the uh, other instances that I gave around um, the imposed uh, duties. And then those were on the international players actually importing in the US. So if you are a, uh, an international player uh, uh, manufacturing inside the country, then probably it won't affect you. But right now, it's still not very clear that if it's going to affect uh, both sides or not. Okay, uh, we have a question now from um, Emin, uh, which is, um, can you just give a quick summary of the market trends for manufacturing of nanocomposite materials for transformer insulation? Uh, that would be even, uh, let's say, fr uh, more fresh topic than uh, SSDs. Um, composite, um, let's say, uh, materials and insulators have been used in the industry for decades now, but nanocomposite materials is something that, which is very new and of course as i've mentioned earlier as well it's a relatively slow moving mar market so if it's something which is still in the r d phase right now uh, we do not expect this uh, any kind of rollout uh, in the near future so it will take at least five to seven years that i've discussed for ssds as well uh, for nano composite materials uh, even though composites are utilized everywhere in the industry for decades now but it's something which is very new and it will take some time for it to be implemented in the utility sector Thank you. Um, we've got a question now for Jared from Hassan, uh, which is, uh, what will be the best performing industries for industrial motors moving forward, uh, given the current global situation? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we see probably the food and beverage industry. Uh, as you know, this is more resilient within the, the market for recession. Uh, people still need food. Also, there's continuing to be a global uh, increase in population. So we, we see food and beverage as being one of the strongest industries uh, to that. Uh, probably the strongest itself. 
Um, other strong, what well, will be the data centers, as I mentioned, uh, the increased use of the, let's say, webinars such as this and the increased load on the internet uh, will cause more capital increase in the data centers. Uh, although the motor applications for these are minimal, the HVAC for these systems uh, does produce an application and opportunity for the suppliers themselves. Thank you, Jared. Uh, we now have a question from Vladimir. Uh, not sure if you'll be able to answer this one, but he is asking uh, as to your sources uh, for the motor information in the presentation. Uh, so we are a primary, uh, primarily a primary research company, meaning we speak directly to the suppliers themselves. Uh, so for the sources themselves in terms of names or even emails, I wouldn't be able to share. Uh, but I can tell you that we are a mix of primary research. Of course, we do our secondary research, such as financial documents and annual reports. Uh, but that is essentially our source. So we're going directly to the suppliers themselves, collecting data and information uh, from the manufacturers of the motors industries, as well as the traction motors for, for both the industrial and traction motors applications. I hope that answers the, the questions. But if you have more more questions on that, of course, we can speak uh, offline on that topic. Okay, uh, the next question, uh, we actually had quite a few people just asking for clarification. Um, mm -hmm. I did my best uh, to answer these myself, but um, a question that we have from several people, which is, can you just clarify the difference between uh, HDM, PMSM, um, and the, the other subset of motor as well? Yeah, sure. So a hybrid traction motors would include a permanent magnet a synchronous reluctance motors, also permanent magnet um, switch reluctance motors, which of course are much more rare and more in the R&D phase. Uh, this would include motors that essentially are able to use reduced uh, permanent magnet materials uh, if needed, uh, such as, the, like I mentioned, Tesla and the, the BMW i3 motors, uh, and even the Toyota motor can be considered in this classification. Uh, so that's kind of the definition of the, the motors themselves and using that as the, the standard and kind of the examples and to go from there. Uh, permanent magnet synchronous motors, uh, I should clarify that this is primarily the radial, uh, ax radial flux rather than the axial flux. Uh, these are the more standard traditional uh, permanent magnet uh, motors that you see uh, in these vehicles themselves as therefore they're the kind of the more dominant topology and ACIM is the AC induction motor which is less commonly used uh, currently uh, at this time for the motors themselves but still uh, have some market share. Okay, perfect. Um, and we'll move on to, uh, just due to time here, uh, our final three questions. Uh, so we have a question from Hassan, uh, who's asking about uh, your thoughts on potential trends towards in-wheel EV motors, uh, Jared. Uh, we do see this as a trend. However, I don't know, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of hype on this trend and that is going to kind of overtake the market. However, we see it as being more of, let's say, a trend within niche markets. Uh, there is going, there's going to be applications for widespread adoption, but from the, the kind of midterm, we see it being more on, I say, commercial vehicles or maybe within the uh, factories or kind of distribution plants for Amazon, for example, for the machines uh, doing the material handling. Uh, so that's kind of how we would predict it moving forward. Uh, and that's primarily due, of course, uh, who, you know, uh, to, to that person that asked the question would know about the unsprung mass. Uh, there is, I did have a discussion with a supplier talking about more near wheel applications. So, of course, reducing the amount uh, of coupling needed uh, and putting it closer to the wheel, however, not inside the wheel. So that could be another opportunity there rather than centralizing the vehicle, but closer to the wheels themselves for the power transmission and of course you don't need as many uh, a larger gearbox to transmit that power but that's kind of where we see it uh, in short just to, to kind of summarize kind of more of a niche application within the ev traction motor market uh, but uh, then again the trend is still increasing and it's still yet to be seen if somebody has a, a really uh, advantageous application for that in wheel motor Okay, uh, the next question from Anne-Marie, um, who's asking if you have a list that you can supply for the uh, main suppliers of motors, uh, as Saqib did for the transformer side and his side of the presentation, um, especially yeah. uh, asking for traction motors. Yep, uh, so as I mentioned, we, we discuss our your, with your supplier, therefore we, we do have a list of all the suppliers on the traction as well as the industrial motor. Um, I would suggest we connect offline and I can probably provide that uh, to you in terms of a general list of that. Uh, we also have it broken down by which motor type and technology type they're producing, but uh, uh, I'm happy to, to share that with you, yeah. 
Perfect. Uh, and then we'll take a final question before we, we close, and I'll give everyone information on where to find uh, the presentation after we finish. Uh, from Lucas, um, will, vehicles, uh, will vehicle OEMs move towards manufacturing uh, of their one electric motor, I think that is? Uh, um, maybe he meant own electric motor? Uh, I'm not sure. Potentially own. One electric uh, motor. Lucas, okay. if you are in the chat, if you just want to clarify. I'll, I'll assume that he meant own electric motors uh, and kind of answer based on that. But uh, yeah, so the I, I think there is going to be a trend in this currently. It kind of differs by region and the Americas, US specifically, they're more vertically integrated. Uh, there's even you know acquisitions, you know, purchasing a motor manufacturer or even a, a test bench or a application a test company to do the work for them and in research and R&D. In Europe, you have kind of it more outsourced. You have more, let's say, technology suppliers uh, that which are the electric motor manufacturers working and collaborating with the OEMs themselves. So I think we'll see more vertical integration moving forward, uh, especially given the current situation. Acquisitions are usually also hand in hand with any type of recession. So uh, we do expect that to be a trend moving forward as well. Okay. Perfect. Um, well, for the sake of time, what we'll do, I think, is close off the questions now. Um, and I will just do a, a closing statement going through some information for you. Um, so firstly, I want to thank uh, Jared and to keep both of you uh, for the great presentation this morning. Uh, and thank you also to everyone uh, that has tuned in today and those that are still here with us uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, I hope it's been insightful for all of you. Um, so just to note, uh, I know people have been asking that after this presentation uh, immediately, if you stay on this page, um, it will convert into a video that will be available for you to watch. Uh, also within the next 24 hours, we will be putting the uh, video on our own website on the Kwame Knowledge Hub. Um, so you'll have access to uh, all of the questions, uh, all the chat and all the functionality that you would have had during the live presentation uh, with the slides. Uh, the next update from me uh, will be that we We'll be uh, publishing the full uh, white paper on the 26th of May. Um, so this will go into far more detail on the industries that we've already talked about here today. Um, but we'll also go into uh, details of some other key industries for the climbing markets, uh, such as the coil winding side uh, and manufacturing. Um, so that will be available on the Climbing Knowledge Hub uh, on the 26th of May. And you will also get a uh, email directly into your inbox uh, with information on how to get your hands on this as well. Uh, and again, Jared and Saqib as the authors of this. Uh, so if you enjoy it today, please do check it out. Uh, my colleagues uh, in the chat uh, will be able to share links. Um, and I think there is one in that slide there actually to uh, sign up for both the Kwame uh, newsletter um, and also um, to find the Kwame Knowledge Hub uh, and webinar information going forward. Um, if anyone in the future is interested in hearing more about what we're doing digitally uh, or would like to be involved uh, with any of the uh, upcoming webinars or digital content that we have planned, uh, please do feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, I'm Liam Herity, the Senior Content Director um, for Kwame uh, Berlin and also the Chicago shows. Um, and I'll post my uh, contact information in the chat at the end of the session. Um, but finally, again, thank you to Jared Askeeb um, and we look forward to seeing uh, hopefully some of you back here in July for our next webinar. Hey, everybody. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.